So we're back in Matthew chapter 12. Actually, we're not back. We're starting Matthew chapter 12. <clears throat> Only took me a little over a year to get here. So let's, let's get into it here. Matthew 12 and verse 1 and 2. Here we go. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered, and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. Uh, back in Bible times, they didn't have Wawa. They didn't have 7-Eleven. But they did have a lot of farmland. And God, because he is love and he's so gracious, he made provision for the need of man. And we can find that provision in Deuteronomy chapter 23. And I'm going to read verses 24 and 25. So that's Deuteronomy 23. Verses 24 and 25. And this is what it says there. When thou comest into thy neighbor's vineyard, then thou mayest eat grapes, thy fill at thine own pleasure, but thou shalt not put any in thy vessel. When thou comest into the standing corn of thy neighbor, then thou mayest pluck the ears with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. So, the first thing, so we see God's provision there. If you come into your neighbor's field or whoever's field and you're hungry and you need to be fed, take it and eat it. Just want to point out a few things there in Deuteronomy. First of all, it says, when thou comest into thy neighbors. Okay. Those words Im imply that it was not a planned stop. You didn't sit in your house and say, I'm going to go over there and get me some of his food. Notice it says, when thou comest. Okay? So, uh, it wasn't predetermined that you were going to do this. You just happened to come into his field and you were hungry. You had a need. So, that's the first thing I want to point out. Uh, and it says, you can eat at thy pleasure. Uh, excuse me. Eat thy fill. So, f eat till you're full, till you're pleased. But you, sh you shall not put any in thy vessel. So in other words, again, it's, it's about human need. It's not you're going over there to take it from your neighbor. That'd be stealing. Okay, so I guess another thing that I didn't put in my notes that that shows us is that God always has been in, uh, concerned with our inward life, our motives, our intentions. That's important to him. Uh, and then, of course, it specifically says in verse 25 of Deuteronomy 23, when thou comest into the standing corn, which is exactly what happened here in Matthew 12 with the uh, disciples. And it says that basically the same thing there. You can eat what you want with your hand. Notice again, <clears throat> it's not like today where you just get a check because you're a single mom or whatever the case may be, but they actually had to go and get it with their hand, right? They had, there was a little bit of work involved. They had to get it themselves. Thou mayest pluck the ear with thine hand, but thou shalt not move a sickle unto thy neighbor's standing corn. So again, the idea is you're not going over there to rob them. This is just if you happen to be in the area. And so God cares for our needs. And that's because God is love and God is gracious. And <clears throat> he still is, by the way, he's still love and he's still gracious. And he's so loving and so gracious that even though the world has rebelled against him, and even though he knew that we would do it from eternity past, he still gave his only begotten son. As it says in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And we should never get tired of hearing that verse. should never get tired of hearing it, even though it's the most well-known and most quoted Bible verse. We should never get tired of hearing it. 
it contains great truths, truths that are wonderful and critical. And I encourage you to just meditate on John 3.16 sometime. As a matter of fact, let's just look at it right now. John 3.16, let's look at it. Well, it tells us there's a God, doesn't it? There is a God. And it tells us that God loves us. Matter of fact, it tells us that God loves everyone. God so loved the world. It tells us how much he loved us. He gave his only begotten son. There's ne never been a greater love known to this world. And anyone, again, can be saved. It says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I'm sure there's many more things that I can't see yet that it tells us. But it tells us, guess what? This wonderful verse has bad news in it. Don't know if you noticed that. It says, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Guess what? People are going to perish if they don't believe in Jesus Christ. That verse tells you that everyone is perishing, actually, the whole world, and that they will perish unless they believe in him. They won't have everlasting life and they will perish unless they believe in Jesus Christ. And uh, I'm sure if you meditate on it, you can find some things in there that I haven't mentioned. But every verse of the Bible is filled with treasures, but you have to dig them out. You have to search them out. So <clears throat> let's read verses 1 through 4 of Matthew 12. Here we go. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, and his disciples were unhungered, and they began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat. But when the Pharisees saw, they said unto him, Behold, thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was unhungered, and they that were with him how he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. So, of course, look at those first four words of verse three. Excuse me, not the first. The first four words in red. Have ye not read? Have ye not read? As Christians, when someone comes to us, us with an accusation or with a condemnation, we must be able to say, have you not read? As Christians, we live by the Bible. We make our choices based upon the whole counsel of God's holy word. So whenever we face a situation, a choice, a question, a temptation, or whatever it is, we should always seek to respond in a biblical way. We should seek to be like the psalmist who wrote Psalm 119. Psalm 119. I'm going to read two verses out of that psalm. It's the biggest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. I encourage you to read the whole thing at some point and meditate on it and apply it. Uh, psalm 119. I'm going to read verses 105 and 128. Psalm 119, verse 105. says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And that means that although we live in a dark world, God's word is a light and it can show us the danger around us and it can show us the right way we need to go on to stay on that narrow way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And also verse 128. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts. That is the word, the scriptures, the commandments. Therefore, I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right. I hate every false way. And, you know, that could be true, truly said of our Lord Jesus Christ, because 
every time someone came to him with anything, that's what he said. It is written, or have you not read, or something along those lines. The point was, his reference for everything in life was the Word of God. And so, even though he is God, he's also a man. And as a man, he lived by the book. And so that's what he did, and that's what we should do. And I like, and I could have, there was many other verses in that huge psalm to pick, but that's why I encourage you to read it for yourself. Um, let me read Matthew 12, 4 again. It says, <clears throat> speaking of, our Lord speaking of King David, it says, How he entered into the house of God and did eat the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat neither for them which were with him, but only for the priests. <clears throat> so when David, King David and his men became hungry while they were fleeing from Saul, the priest gave the showbread for them to eat, which normally, typically, according to the word of God, was not lawful for them to eat. And Jesus brings this up as a defense for what his disciples did. Uh, and what that story and many other scriptures in the Bible teach us is that love is the fulfillment of the law, not the breaking of it. It's the fulfillment of the law. Let me read you the notes from my Rock of Ages study Bible on verse 3 here. It says, David, God's anointed, was being persecuted by Saul. He was a fugitive and rejected by Israel. When he was hungry, he ate of the showbread, which was unlawful. In rejecting David, God's anointed, Israel was out of God's will and sinning against his word. When this happens, holy ceremonies cease to be holy. And thus the consecrated showbread became common in God's sight. Uh, and that's what happened here, because the root and offspring of David was now here and they were rejecting him and uh, the Lord uses this example it's also a hint of who he is too just like they rejected King David early on they also are now rejecting the son of David the Messiah and in case you're wondering you can go read that later if you want it's found in 1 Samuel 21 verses 1 through 6 Another point I want to make is the very fact that Jesus here and many other places in the Gospels brings up this story and other stories from the Old Testament. It teaches us that Jesus Christ, when he walked this earth, considered the Old Testament to be inspired by God and accurate in its record of history. That's an important point to make. And another important point to make is that Jesus didn't have the original copies of the scriptures, by the way. He had copies of the copies. So the best apologetic there is, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the best apologetic. It can be helpful to study different fields of knowledge as we interact with people and seek to defend the faith. But don't forget, it's all about Jesus. Instead of sharing all the facts about the thousands of ancient manuscripts that prove that the Bible we have today is accurate, instead of citing the multitude of archaeological finds that validate the Word of God, we can just say simply, <laughs> Jesus taught that the Bible is true. Are you calling Jesus a liar? You see, that is a way to evangelize rather than... Now, don't get me wrong. It's good and important apologetics, and knowing that information can be helpful. But what I'm saying is that let's keep the main thing the main thing, and that's Jesus Christ. We have When we're evangelizing others, we've got to make it personal. When we evangelize, we have to keep Christ at the center of the conversation. That's what I'm saying.
Let me read verse 5 of Matthew 12. we got a fussy baby in the background here. We'll get over it. Matthew 12, 5. Or have ye not read in the law? Well, he said it again. Have ye not read? Have ye not read in the law? Now he's being more specific. Have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Huh? What does that mean? Well, let's go look at Numbers chapter 28. <clears throat> Numbers 28, verses 9 and 10, and we're going to see exactly what the Lord is talking about. <clears throat> Let me read, before I read Numbers 28, 9 and 10, I'll read Matthew 12, 5 one more time. He said, Have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? What does he mean? The answer is in Numbers 28, 9 and 10. It says, On the Sabbath day... Two lambs of the first year without spot, and two tenth deals of flour for a meat offering, mingled with oil and the drink offering thereof. This is the burnt offering of the Sabbath, beside the continual burnt offering and his drink offering. God commanded his people to do certain work on the Sabbath. You see that? That's what Jesus is talking about when he says... Have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days, the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? See, the Ten Commandments, which include the Sabbath, were given in Exodus chapter 20, right? Then Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Later, these uh, commandments concerning sacrifices, a part of the Old Testament worship, were given. Uh, and they were there was a special work that had to be done on the Sabbath day. And so the point is that human need, at least this is what I believe the point that the Lord is making is human need triumphs, trumps ritual. Human need is more important than ritual. That's what I believe the message is here. Now, don't get me wrong. Uh, complete obedience to God's commandments is good and right. And we should seek to obey him as much as possible. But God loves man. That's why he gave the commandments in the first place. God loves man. So it's stupid and evil to condemn a hungry person picking some food on the Sabbath. Especially when human need is in question, but also when God made specific provision for it, as we saw earlier in the book. So let's look at verse 6, Matthew 12, 6. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. <whistles> Jesus says, one greater than the temple. Another of the many amazing claims made by our Lord Jesus Christ, and that could only be made by God himself. Let me read another one for you, Matthew 23, 21. Jesus said, Whoso shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Scratch that, I apologize. It's Matthew, don't know how I did that, but Matthew 12, 6. I didn't even have to go to. Matthew 23, because it's right here. He says, I say unto you that in this great, in this place is one greater than the temple. Oh, sorry, it's my first day. All right. So the reason why I read Matthew 23, 21 is to point out that if you swear by the temple, you're swearing by him that dwelleth therein. In other words, God himself. And so now you combine that with Matthew 12, 6. And it says that in this place is one greater than the temple. That means Jesus is God. Because if God is equal with his, God is greater than his temple. 
it says in Matthew 23, 21, and Matthew 12, 6, Jesus says he's greater than the temple. That is absolute proof that he's saying he's God. And that's an, a critical and important statement. So let me read Matthew 12, 7. Then he says, But if ye had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. God commanded the Jews to perform the temple sacrifices, but not to go through the motions while causing harm to others. That's not what he wants. Let me give you two examples of this. Uh, uh, while one, one will be from history. Uh, one will be from Bible history and one example from Jewish history. So let's turn to Exodus chapter 1 going to be in a few verses so if you want to turn there Exodus 1 15 through 21 listen to this the king of Egypt spake to the Hebrew midwives of which the name of the one was Shifra and the name of the other Pua and he said when you do the office of a midwife to the Hebrew women and see them upon the stools if it be a son then ye shall kill him and but if it be a daughter then she shall live but the midwives feared God and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said unto them, Why have ye done this thing and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively and are delivered before the midwives come in unto them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. And it came to pass, because the midwives feared God, that he made them houses. See, I don't think the midwives were exactly honest with Pharaoh. Okay? But God blessed them because there was something great at stake greater at stake than telling a lie even though telling a lie is a terrible sin it's listed in that terrible passage in revelation 21 verse 8 where it says all liars shall go to the lake of fire yet in this case when the option was to either murder babies or lie to pharaoh they made the choice and it says here uh, that because the midwives feared God, <clears throat> God made them houses and he dealt well with them. And so there's an example that just because uh, God, God gives us commandments, he doesn't want us to just go through the motions of keeping those commandments while causing harm to others. Okay. And then the other lesson, I said, I'd give you a lesson from, uh, the Bible history, now Jewish history, the Holocaust. Uh, you know, Schindler and other people lied and hid Jews during the Hitler, uh, Holocaust. And I think they did the right thing uh, for doing that. So the point is not to go around lying, of course. The point is, is that God doesn't want us to go through the motions while we're hurting others to do so. That's, that's the point I see. As a matter of fact, he said in that same verse, Matthew 12, 7, I will have mercy, not sacrifice. See, I will have mercy, not sacrifice. And if you knew what that meant, Jesus said to them, you would have not condemned the guiltless. God wants us to be merciful. It's very important to him. A matter of fact, Jesus Christ commanded us in Luke 6, 36. He said it, be ye therefore merciful. And he said, be ye merciful as your father also is merciful. What an example. You know, God is so merciful that it can't even be described. I don't think are fully comprehended, but that's who we're to imitate. That's who we're to seek to imitate. To be merciful like he is. 
Now, I don't say this with pride, but I do recognize what God has done in my life. And I do believe that I'm more merciful now than I was when I was a babe in Christ, when I was a younger Christian, when I was going around knocking people on the head with my Bible. Okay. Uh, and one of the reasons why I'm more merciful now is because I've had lots of time to fail. That's why I've had lots of time to fail. And this is one of the many ways that God fulfills that great promise in Romans 8, 28, which says, and we know that God works all things together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He works all things together. All means all, even sin. Somehow God never condones sin and sin is bad and sin is evil, but God can even use that and work it together for his good. Speaking of the Holocaust, I don't believe that there would be a state of Israel fulfilling Bible prophecy without the Holocaust, which was a terrible evil that happened. Yet, because of the Holocaust, the world for five minutes had a conscience and gave the Jewish people a sliver of land in the, in the Middle East because God said it would happen. And that's the only reason. But the point is, it, had to, it, had to, it took the Holocaust to bring that to pass because God works all things together for good. And uh, all means all. So blessed be his holy name and may he help us to be merciful as he is merciful. And when he says in Matthew 12, 7, I will have mercy. When he says, be merciful as your father, which is in heaven is merciful. He's not coming up with a new theory about God. This has always been his heart as revealed in the scriptures because Hosea 6.6 6 is what uh, Jesus is quoting, actually, when he says, if you had known what this meaneth, I will have mercy. Jesus is quoting Hosea 6.6. 6. And I'm going to read another verse, two verses, three verses, excuse me. Micah, Micah chapter 6, verses 6 through 8. says this now keeping in mind the context here that with what we've been talking about the lord says <clears throat> wherewith shall i come before the lord and bow myself before the high god shall i come before him with burnt offerings with calves of a year old will the lord be pleased with thousands of rams with ten thousands of rivers of oil shall i give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul, he hath, the answer is no. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God. That's what he wants. Notice it says, he hath showed thee, O man, not Jew, not Gentile, not rich, not poor, everyone, everyone. Oh man. Matthew 12, eight. For the son of man is Lord, even of the Sabbath day. So greater than the temple first, he says, okay. Mean, that means he's God. Now he says he's Lord, even of the Sabbath day. You know what that means? It means guess who gave that commandment on top of Mount Sinai to Moses? Jesus Christ, the Lord. Over and over again, throughout the Bible, the Lord Jesus Christ claims to be Jehovah. God Almighty. Only the one who gave the Sabbath could be greater than the Sabbath. And I know you've heard this many times and you're going to hear it again because Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's so important to point out uh, and to understand and to believe. 
If you don't believe that Jesus Christ is Jehovah, you're not saved, you're not going to heaven, and you're not a Christian, period. He said that. He said to the Pharisees, he says, if you believe not that I am, you will die in your sins. And I am is from Exodus chapter 3, the one who appeared to Moses at the burning bush, the great I am, God Almighty, Jehovah. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you shall die in your sins. So it's very important, and that's why I talk about it all the time. Matthew 12, 9 says, When he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. Their synagogue. What a sad statement that those two words contain. Their synagogue. God's people were getting together without him. It was their synagogue. God's people were getting together without him, and they didn't even know it. This is happening today. It's sad, but it's true. Matter of fact, it's one of the many signs that the return of Christ is near. Um, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, there's the seven letters to the seven churches. And I'm not going to get into it as much as we will later, but those seven letters are not, not only written to seven churches 2000 years ago, but they also are prophetic. They are a prophecy of that. Each letter describes the characteristics of the church throughout the last 2000 years. Okay. You can Google that and you'll find te good teachings on it. But the main point I want to make is I said that the fact that people all around this world are gathering in the name of Christ right now and God's not there, that's proof. And when I say God's not there, obviously God is omnipresent. But God also is present in special ways. And so I think you know what I mean. You know, there's a difference between gathering in Jesus' name on Sunday and Jesus Christ is, is running the show. You know, there's lots of churches out there. They're, it's their church and they're running it, not Jesus Christ. And we find this in the church uh, of the Laodiceans. That's why I'm bringing it up. In Revelation 3, you'll find the church of the Laodiceans. And what I just want to point out to you quickly is this. In the, in the letters to the seven churches, you'll find, you have to look very closely but you will find that the first six churches, it specifically says it is a church at a certain location, right? Church at Philadelphia, the church in Sardis, okay? Those, those pronouns, those descriptions, it's, it's clearly a church of Jesus Christ at a certain location, but not when you get to the last one. It says, just one word, the church of, not Laodicea, the church of the Laodiceans. See, the first six are the church of Jesus Christ at a certain location. The last one says the church of the Laodiceans. It's their church. And see, the word Laodicea itself means rule of the people. That's what the word means. And if I had a word to describe overall our modern form of Christianity, especially in America today, it would be the rule of the people. Um, if you've if you've ever been to a church where they vote on any kind of big decisions they're going to make, you, I, I won't go as far to say that's a Laodicean church, but they're acting like it because uh, what does the word Laodicea mean? Rule of the people. First of all, congregations have lost people in them. Let's be honest. I mean, there was a Judas among twelve, right? So congregations have lost people in them. So we're going to take a vote to see what the lost people want to do with the church of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? You know, you may not like this, but in the Bible, from Mount Sinai to the throne of heaven, you know what we find? Elders. Elders. Not, not voting. God fills 
men with his Holy Spirit anoints them and they rule over his people. And if they do the wrong thing, God deals with it. And if they, and, and they do the right thing, praise God. It's not a Christianity in a local church is not a democracy where you vote. It's an, it's actually an oligarchy. Okay. Like a dictatorship of a group of men, not one man. I said a group. Now this is straight from the Bible. You won't find the way churches are run today. Uh, as what I'm talking about here as it pertains to this, it's elders, a group of elders, not an elder running the show, not one man, a dictator. No, a group of men who are filled and led by the Holy Spirit. And they decide as God leads them what direction the church is to go in and they do it. They don't take a vote to see what some of the lost people or the carnal Christians or the babes in Christ want to do. They just do as God leads. And if there's a problem, God deals with that leadership. If you've read the Bible, you know God is able to deal with leadership when they do the wrong thing. So anyway, not to, that's one of my uh, whatever you want to call it. Jeez. Yeah, I try not to do that, but uh, I do believe it's a sign. Back to the back to the point. One of the ways I know that the Lord's return is near is that these seven churches are prophetic in, in Revelation. Now, although Laodice the church of the Laodiceans prophetically to me is the church of the tribulation because it's a false church. If you recall Revelation 3:20, behold I stand at the door and knock, Jesus says, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and sup with him. He's talking, not he's not evangelizing to the lost world. He's talking to the church of the Laodiceans. They're running things and he's on the outside knocking. And you can believe that there are local churches like that today. And so that tells me we are overlapping the age of Philadelphia right into Laodicea. Uh, we're on the edge. His return is nearer than it's ever been. Now, to finish up in Matthew 12 for today, uh, in case you wanted to know, we're on Matthew 12, 9. says, when he was departed thence, he went into their synagogue. I'm going to finish in case you want to know what a synagogue is or where that word came from. Listen to what David Cloud writes in his Way of Life Encyclopedia of the Bible and Christianity. He says this, a synagogue is a Jewish religious meeting place. Synagogues were built after the first temple was destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, and the Jews were dispersed during the 70 year captivity. Though the temple was rebuilt during the days of Ezra, most of the Jews remained in Babylon. After the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in 70 AD, and the destruction of Jerusalem in 135 AD. Most Jews were forced out of the land of Israel. Many were taken captive and many fled the Roman armies. They spread throughout the nations during the times of the Persian, Greek, Roman empires, and even into modern times. Everywhere they went, they built these synagogues for worship. The synagogue was the place of teaching and the performance of religious duties. End of quote. And so, in other words, he's saying that they got kicked out of Jerusalem and Israel and the temple was destroyed. They lost everything because their whole religion was connected to that building, the tabernacle first and then the temple. So without that, they came up with a way to still meet and to keep their religion alive. Their, uh, now, regardless of what it, it turned into over time, obviously, they rejected the Lord. So it's very unfortunate. But uh, if my memory serves me correct, there had to be at least 10 Jewish men living in a town or city, and then they would build a synagogue. That was the minimum requirement. So, but anyway, uh, it says that uh, in Matthew 12, 9, that... He went into their synagogue. And so my prayer is that this will be the Lord's church and not their church.